All right, y'all. This is the Texas Garden Guy Show, and I am Destin Nowak, Texas Garden Guy. And I got my first guest ever today on the podcast, and his name is Phil's Figs. And, uh, you know, if y'all watched my channel for a while, you know that I am big into figs. Well, if you think I'm big into figs, his whole channel is about figs. So uh, I'll let Phil kind of give an introduction and introduce himself. Hey, guys. Yeah, my name's Phil. I've been doing figs. 11 years plus and I think last year I decided to take the plunge and go full force and create an entity out of it and my background I have a background in business I also have a graduate degree in uh, paleoceanography I got my master's uh, here in Wilmington North Carolina and so I'm a geologist I do environmental science and I have just grown up gardening and figs came into my view when I was traveling Europe and I had a fresh fig probably 13 years ago. And I go, what the heck is this? Why does this not <laughs> exist in my life? And right. uh, I have a heavy Italian side on my dad's side and they always talked about figs and heirloom varieties that someone had brought over. Right. And I went down the rabbit hole and I got obsessed. I loved propagating. And before I knew it, I had this awesome collection and now that I live in coastal North Carolina, I can put them in the ground and I haven't looked back. It keeps growing and growing and growing and it looks better and better. So that's my little background uh, on figs. Oh, uh, what zone are y'all in? We're in eight a, but I am hey, like, so that's not bad at all. No. And I am the only reason we're eight a is cause we'll have like 10 freezes a year, but we'll get like, if that jet stream dump comes down, does a dip, we'll get that Arctic air and it'll hit us. And like last Christmas, we had a whole slew of stuff in the teens and twenties. And we're like, we didn't know what to do, but we'll have four years where that doesn't happen. So right. it can be a little capricious when freezes happen. But if I'm right on the water, which I have a, a boat ramp in my neighborhood for the intercoastal oh, wow. waterway. And sometimes we get that more like, um, maritime climate so we're almost 8b right yeah it's it's weird people think that like the further south you are that like it just goes like this the zones go like up like that it actually kind mm -hmm. of curves up you know I'm, I'm in weird, shape, isn't it yeah like people in like uh like coastal washington are like 8a you know it's like it's yeah. weird you know oh, and well, um, i have a friend in seattle that has a palm tree in his backyard and i was like oh my god <laughs> you're like yeah 48 it's degrees wild. north, you know, but no, it, it's, it's wild because, you know, I had, um, I had so many figs last year. We had a real, we've had in the last two or three years, we've had hard freezes mm -hmm. and uh, I've, I've had my figs and I, I don't know, uh, typically, you know, figs like to bush. They like to come up from the roots and grow bushy. But if I can get mine to be a perfect little tree, it's like the best thing in the world to me. But like after a hard freeze, you know, you lose that main trunk and it comes back and it's just all bushy again. It's heartbreaking, man. It's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. Uh, and it focuses it, a lot on growth. So all of a sudden you don't get any fruit set. And you're like, no. Yeah. <laughs> have, have, you, have, have you noticed after the freeze? Um, if, it seems like after the freeze when like, well, this is what happened. We, we had like, a week of like where it was in the teens. And so I went out there and I took a bunch of cuttings and stuck mm -hmm. them in the fridge because mm -hmm. I was like, I'm going to have a bunch of stuff lost. Yeah. It's like, so now's the time I'm going to do cuttings. Uh, have you found that a lot of the figs that come back after the freeze, they it seems like they grow faster and they grow stronger afterwards. It's almost like a dormancy period for some, for like, I feel like the ones that died back real hard came back stronger than ever this year. I actually just, posted a video on YouTube on this. It, it called like regenerative pruning. And what I've noticed that if you have severe dieback, but you have an established root system, that the tree will aggressively push out new growth. Right. And so I've seen that happen. The other piece is, especially when you're in the dead of winter and your tree is dormant, like sap is not flowing. Um, I think it's generally unaffected by hard freezes unless you go down into like yeah, single digits. It's the wow. late winter, early spring freezes that really mess with fig trees, especially here. Yeah. Uh, are, are most of yours in containers or do you have a lot in the ground? I have uh, 18 in the ground. Oh, wow. And I made like a cool little bocce court uh, that 
I'd like to have that like a peely nursery look to yeah. it. So I don't look like I'm right. hoarding things. If you walk around the corner, you'll see my hoarding scenario, which I've definitely so, like, posted on. my house. Yeah. <laughs> a fake no, you're such a sick setup, by the way. I am always like, ah, oh, I got to get the shade cloth. I got to do this. I look so Dude. good. It's um, it's a lot of it's a lot of work, man. And well, and, and I live in a subdivision. I don't. Are you in a subdivision, or are you in uh, like you, you live out in the country? I have a nice neighborhood, but it's no HOA. Okay, yeah. See, I have an HOA, um, and I'm restricted on what I can plant in the ground. Mm. Uh, not because not because the HOA so much, but because of I have a bunch of fiber wires, fiber cables, and stuff. I, I can't plant anything in the ground from like five feet of my fence. Oh. And so every so almost everything has got to be in containers. But you know, I I think it's fine though. You know, it's figs fine. figs are so hardy. Um, you can grow figs in containers for years. You know, yes. just like six like like citrus. People don't people think people here in the Houston area are pretty much gave given up on citrus. You know, really? because they they keep digging it up and having to replace it every single year. Yeah. And so you know, I grow mine in containers every year and just bring them in the greenhouse, bring mm-hmm. them in the garage. You I know, do that and too. you can I have re- three citrus that I do at the same thing. Yeah, well, and you, and you got the greenhouse now. I saw. Um, it, oh yeah, it seemed, it, 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 you're, you're about to be in the same situation that I was in. So when I bought my first greenhouse, I was like, "Oh, this is so big!" And then it feels like the the big bigger greenhouse that you get, the more stuff you find to put into it. And then you're like, "Okay, I need a bigger greenhouse now." Like you're gonna be there soon, especially if you're like propagating and selling as much as like I see you are. You know? Oh my gosh! Like, it, I mean, I have to be very like. I'm very grateful, but like everything I post, it's like out the door and I'm just seeing the tip of the iceberg. And what I literally, I I started moving my cuttings out because my greenhouse is getting over a hundred, but I was like, what could I do with this space? And now I've started to introduce, I got my first dragon fruit, but I also got a bunch of succulents and I'm like, okay, they can tolerate this. And I've been kind of filling the shelves, but I don't know how I'm going to move that product. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a little complicated when you start getting into other things. Like I'm pretty much, this is the first year that I was like legitimately selling my fig trees. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and, and, uh, you kind of want to start diversifying a little bit, you know, I moved in some ornamental, some hibiscus. Yeah. Uh, I really gotten into like desert roses and plumerias recently. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, you get a little diversified, you know, with that. And, but then you're like, I like it, but does, does someone else like it? Like dragon fruits, especially, uh, yeah. I, 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 someone gave me a, a dragon fruit and I propagated it and I got like 20 of them and nobody wants them. Like, oh, nobody, really? nobody, I this can't give them away. It's up dude. to people like us to be like, you have to try a dragon fruit. Like a truly well, ripe one, right? <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, and, and, and I, I've got one that's about, fi- um, God, it's probably about 10 foot tall. Yeah. Uh, and I've got an idea where I want to like go out. My dad's got like a hundred acres and he's got oak trees and pecan trees and stuff. Beautiful. I want to like next spring go out there and just put some dragon fruits, like maybe two or three around like a big oak tree mm-hmm. and just let them climb up the tree, oh. like all spring and summer long, you know, and then just go nuts, you know, and just see what happens. Cause I, I don't know if y'all have bats cause with the dragon fruits, um, if you don't have the species of bat that actually pollinates it, you have to go and hand pollinate yourself. Oh, oh yeah. We definitely have bats every night. It's beautiful. My kids say good night to them, you know, but right. um, I'd have to check to see if they would be a potential pollinator. Yeah. Uh, Epic gardening does a good video on going mm-hmm. out and doing the pollination by hand. So it's, if you can reach it, it's a good option to do it by hand. You know, yeah. you, just, you, t- you take like a paintbrush and you go and you put it like in a Pyrex dish, you okay. mix all the pollen together and you go back and you put, you brush the pollen back on and it's, uh, it's really neat. And that's your really kids cool. would, your kids would probably love it. You know, oh, they it's, love it. it's, I mean, yeah, I have a station for them. This is anybody who gardens, and has kids, this is the best thing I've done. And it like reminds me of gardening with my grandmother is I have a little station and they can get as dirty as they want. And they Absolutely. have their own cups. They have like, go after it, let them Montessori feel it out. And I can go and do my work. It takes a little longer, but they're out there with me and they can see the results when they start picking the cherry tomatoes or picking right. the figs right off the vine. Oh yeah. 
are are you a are you a fresh right off the tree eater or do you like I like to take mine and go put them in the fridge oh. and like let them cool down because well it's like a hundred degrees out here and sometimes you'll and sometimes you'll bite into like a fresh fig right off the tree and it's like biting in like molten lava it's like you microwaved the fig you know and <laughs> yeah. so, so I I I feel like if you let them rest in the fridge like overnight or something you know it'll really it, like it kind of sweetens and so and, you know, kind of cools them down, you know, it's it like, them down so if you get nice sugar it, content that really, yeah, here, here's my favorite thing to eat with as a, like with a, as a fig lover. And it kind of got me into figs in the first place is just a fresh fig. I mean, I think that's why we grow fig trees is because a, yep. a store-bought fig will never be that good. Um, well, and good luck finding them at the store. Like you can, you have to like really find a place that sells them at a yeah. store, like oh unless, gosh, unless they're yeah. dried. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and like every morning, fresh figs, I have, I go and I pick, I have my coffee and a coffee is a yeah. great complimentary flavor profile for a fig. Cause it's a fig is so syrupy yes. sweet, right? So it's like yeah. adding agave nectar to your coffee, but it's just you go back and forth. Absolutely. I, I need to do that for like breakfast in the morning, you know, cause they're not super shelf stable, fresh, you know, like mm -hmm. unless you dehydrate, like I, I don't know how, how long, how long will a fig stay like fresh in your fridge or do they even last that long? They don't last long because I eat them, but uh, yeah. I would say probably like three to five days before you start getting yeah. some mold development. Before they start getting real soft, like real droopy and, and that's soggy. That's like me being generous in a way too. Like yeah. three days, I usually would say. Yeah, we uh, we typically take ours. If I don't eat them fresh, we'll take them, we'll wash them, we'll cut them in half, cut them in quarters, um, and then freeze them. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we we make a lot of like fig jelly. Nice. Uh, the fig flavor on its own is kind of it's not like bland, but like the fig jelly like just by itself isn't like super great. So mm -hmm. we like to mix it with uh, we'll do like a fig strawberry Ooh. or like a fig blueberry. Mm -hmm. And then I, I gotta send I gotta send you some. We have some. I'm, I'm gonna have to send you a care package. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's good, dude. Well, and and I've probably got like ten like one gallon bags in, in, in my freezer. I want to try to make, I've seen where they make like wine or mead out of figs. I, I would it. love to try. I would love to fi figure it's, it's so sugary. Why not? I mean, it has the highest sugar content of all fruit of any fruit. Oh my gosh. You know, see it, videos it, of people's like bricks contents of figs. And I was like, it kind of ties back to like, why aren't figs more popular in American like cuisine and culture? But um Yeah. Well, and seeing how they've been around for so long, you know, right. like, you know, going back to like Adam and Eve, I, I saw that you, I saw that you get, you're given a fig presentation. I did. And I, I was did. like, I, I was like, I wonder if he's using the same, some of the same slides that I use when I do my I fig see presentation. I definitely touched on like Mesopotamia and the Sumerians yep. and it's like the first yes. cultivated plant because right. of its propagation right. ability. Right. Yes. Well, and, and so a lot of people compare it. So in the in the bible the adam and eve you know they say it's the the apple tree mm -hmm. um but if you if you look at a lot of illustrations of like the garden of eden um it's usually depicted as like a fig tree a fig tree leaf if you if you right. go back and look at even at like the um uh where, where is it in venice or the vatican you know vatican the, the scene of yeah, the scene with you know at uh, the Garden of Eden actually it should like I said they say it's an apple tree but it looks like a fig leaf and if you if you've seen a, an apple leaf it doesn't look anything like a fig leaf like no. whatsoever you that's know that's really interesting I uh, have to look back at that oh yeah like the first thing if you, if you just type in Adam and Eve fig I mean and so many things pop up you know I know you said you did some traveling in Europe mm -hmm. um, did you go to so I we did a fun fact on the Grow Bros podcast recently yeah uh, is that Tur Great is podcast, that Turkey by the way. oh thanks man it, it's a work in progress mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I didn't know that Turkey was actually like the main uh, exporter of figs in the entire world I guess it makes sense like the brown Turkey fig mm -hmm. there's a lot of Turkish uh, you know but I, I know you mentioned Italy. So uh, you, 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 when you were visiting Italy, you saw a bunch of fig varieties and people that were growing a lot of fig trees. Oh my, that's where it all first started because I went over there only knowing, literally only knowing a like, dark fig. Like a fig was a purple fig that you just ate, probably a brown turkey. And I went to like the village where my family was from. And then I went to, so cool. I was with a friend and we stayed at his dad's third cousin's house, you know, and 
we for dessert we just had a bowl of fresh figs and they were green honey figs and they mm. peeled theirs i think it was a braba crop but i ate it and i was like what is this thing and they're like it's a fig they said it so like nonchalant and i was like how yeah. have i not had this and that literally like set the ball in motion in 2011 yeah. And, and every grandma has a fig tree in their backyard in Italy. I'm sure just like here yeah, in Texas, right. like everybody's grandma had a Celeste or a brown turkey fig tree in their backyard. Right. That, that's how it is. Now you said they peeled their figs. Are you, are you a skin eater or not? I'm a skin you, eater. I, I, I think there's too are. much flavor on the table to really to lose out on the fig, but it might depend on the fig variety too. That's true. Some are fuzzier than others. Sometimes mm-hmm. like the fuzz on the out, like the outside will like irritate my throat a little bit. Mm-hmm. So I'm usually, I pop them open and like eat the insides, you know, and just get all that gushiness. Slurp it down. It's like, yeah, man. Like I, I just love that flavor. It's amazing. You know, um, now I saw you posted a video of like your number one asked question about like figs and mm-hmm. you were, you said, uh, containers. I, yeah. I watched it. I saw the intro and I was like, Oh, I know exactly what question you said in containers. The number one question I get about figs is, are there wasps in my figs? Yes. You know, I, yeah. And the answer is no, probably. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Most likely. No. Yeah. Yeah, you want to you want to tell I've 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 told it a million times. I'll let you I'll let you tell it though. I'm gonna get nerdy with it, but so even better. Oh, cool. So I've learned. So there's three main types of figs. Um, They're your San Pedro varieties. So if anyone's heard of a Desert King, that's your San Pedro, where the Breba crop is self fertile, and the main crop requires pollination from a specific fig wasp. Specific species. Specific species. Uh, yeah, um, it's technically a parasitic wasp in the, that family, but it's exclusive just to the fig. In my presentation, I had the name, and now I'm blanking on it. I apologize, but they live in the male capra figs, and so male figs are completely different than what people are familiar with. Right? Uh, they have pollen. They do have two crops. Sometimes they will fruit, like uh, edible fruit, but generally. They are the pollen holders and the fig wasp will hatch inside these figs after being planted there by a female fig and they will go out in search of other male figs to create colonies. Uh, When they go out, they will inadvertently go into a female fig, pollinate it, caprify it, and the seeds are now fertile, but they'll essentially die in there, but they get digested by the juices. You will never eat the actual wasp. The ends... Well, and, and so that's a key thing right there. If you ever had wasps in your fig, it means that fig wasn't completely ripe because mm-hmm. the, because the enzymes break down the figs the, or the, the fig wasp, the 100%. enzymes break them down completely. Yep. So it, yep. and it's just a natural process. In fact, I think I listened to an Epic Gardening podcast and they touched on that where like even a vegan guy was like, listen, I will eat figs because it's a natural process and you don't actually consume the wasp itself by the time it's ripe. Right. No, for sure. But most figs that we have will never see a fig wasp. Mm -hmm. You know, not just because we're not in the area where that wasp exists, but because, you know, we have common figs that don't need a wasp. Exactly. So that's the second of the two. Uh, the uh, the third that we probably won't touch on much is the Smyrna fig. So when people see the dried yeah. Calamurna figs, that's a commercially produced fig, but also originates in Turkey. So there's more yeah. than just brown turkey. There's other figs out there, uh, which you probably oh, yeah. know. And then, uh, and then you have your common fig, uh, which is Parthenocarpic. So it's self-fertile. It's self-fruiting. I love that word. <laughs> I love Parthenocarpic. That's my favorite word, dude. I love the way it rolls off the tongue. It just rolls off the tongue. You're like, I am. It does, dude. A botanist. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. I love that, man. Hey, you'll get a ripe fruit. You can't plant a fig seed unless it's been caprified uh, with that fruit, but we don't need it. It'll do it on its own, and that's okay with us. Have, Have you ever grown one from seed? No, but I'm about to. I, I'm really? working with um, Anthony from the Millennial Gardener. Uh, he hooked me up to okay. some uh, caprifig cuttings, and so I'm. I really want to get into the pollinating thing. I'll probably 
there's another great resource, um, the Fig Hunter. Yeah, He'll he's a good dude. Some, <laughs> he's a hoot man. Yeah, and he's uh, a wild man, dude. <laughs> is he? Yeah. yeah. So but um, he he will send out capra figs with pollen if you want to self pollinate. And I do want to delve into. I even like I was like I have this greenhouse, and all of a sudden with the greenhouse. If anyone gets in the greenhouse growing, your brain will explode with ideas, right? And yeah. I'm like, oh, I'm going to get Because of the controlled there. environment. Right. And I'm right. going to get a capra fig. I'm going to have someone ship in wasps, and I'm just going to keep them in this little climate-controlled place. And then I'm going to capra for my figs, and then, you know, who knows? That's awesome. <laughs> well, so – I, I, I was, when I was doing research for my fig presentation, I, my, my presentation is called figs can save the world because they're a uh, keystone species in a lot mm -hmm. of rainforests and stuff. Um, not all f fig is a broad term used for like the ficus species. And there's like right. thousands of varieties of ficuses and only like a small percentage of them are actually edible to humans. Mm. Uh, but what in my research, I had seen that in, in Egypt, they had had, some fig species, um, but apparently like the pollinator wasp had gone extinct or for, because of a drought or something happened, they wow. had actually figured out a way to manipulate the fig into thinking it was being pollinated by puncturing it with needles. Yeah. So they did some and sort so, of anthropogenic pollination, hand pollination. Yeah. Their own. Right. And so I think the fig hunter has a video that he, he sent me. It for a way to manipulate some of his figs. Cause that's what I was wondering. Some of those figs that he sent me, um, he sent me some cuttings Nice, probably back in, he sent me a pet care package to try out the taste of a bunch of them. Oh, and then, uh, cool. and then he sent me a bunch of cuttings. And so I was wondering, I was like, if these cuttings come up, are they going to be self pollinating? Are they going to be parked in a carpet or am I have to go and actually do it on my own? Mm -hmm. So we'll see I've got a couple that are still alive, uh, but it's just been, it's been so hot and dry uh, this year, but uh, the, I mean, the figs have been doing great though. I've, I've mm -hmm. been very surprised at how many figs I'm getting. Uh, a lot of people think, don't know that like figs are super drought resistant, they drought are. tolerant, but if you want to get more fruit, watering more often is going to get you more fruit. Um, and I water daily. I water every single day. My figs are getting watered. Um, do you, what, what do you fertilize? Do you use any kind of fertilizer? I do. In fact, I did a big, we have relatively acidic soil here. Um, That's nice. A lot of blueberry growers, uh, but okay. you know, figs like that neutral soil. So I amended the whole area with a bunch of um, gardening lime. So I'll hit it with that uh, calcium carbonate plus magnesium, and that'll bring up the pH. And then I also hit it with some Epsom salts too. So you have more salts, the, it'll help with the pH balance around here. Uh, okay. And, and then that's in the beginning of the year. And then I focus on, I use that Alaska fish fertilizer. The stinky it, stuff. It's the stinkiest stuff. Like, and also keep your dog away from it because he will, he or she will <laughs> roll oh my all God. in it. And then you'll have two messes. Um, but yeah. they really like the nitrogen forward stuff. And then um, in my pots, I used this Mother Earth Grow that was more nitrogen focused, but I also balanced it with the phosphorus and um, and potassium because you still need those two in the macronutrient world. And then, are, are you using? Oh, go ahead. Sorry, no, go ahead. Oh no, the the main thing too is I also added a bunch of bone meal, so I really wanted them the fruit this year, and so I would just yeah. like I was generous about it. I did little handfuls for my three gallon potted ones yeah. and then in the ground i was just like dump chunk 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 are, are, you, are you a measurer or are you just you go by feeling like when it comes I'm to like green guy i yeah. i want to the scientist in me will measure and then after the 30th to 45th pot at some point <laughs> yeah. i got the idea let's go with it oh, we'll yeah. roll with it so that alaskan fish fertilizer are you uh is that a foliar feed or are you just doing a soil drench with it i'm just doing a solo drench the only okay. foliar feed, and I forgot to mention this, is worm casting tea. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been using worm casting yeah. tea. There's a great small company here in Wilmington called, like, um, I wish I could promote it, like, uh, Underground something. He uses an African species of earthworm that he controls. Uh, oh, cool. I don't think they do his that, bidding. But, yeah. <laughs> and, and he, I mean, he introduced me. He's like, you can make a tea out of this. It's foliar, so it's great for new cuttings. 
and you could apply it to those simple root systems. You're not going to burn anything. And yeah. basically he took like a six ounce, take a six ounce thing. I throw in a five gallon bucket, fill the five gallon bucket up and then use that solution after it's steeped and you can put it all over the plant. And I saw a significant difference with worm castings enough to that. I was like, I should make, do my own vermiculture to that point. Are you doing it yet? I'm about to, I have my compost yeah. bin and I was like, it's, it's full of worms. And I was like, I should just do vermiculture instead of trying to get the bacteria to digest it all. So are, are you full on gardening or are you just focusing on the figs? I'm probably 90% on figs, but I grew up a gardener. A lot of gardening is yeah. common. I grew up in Lancaster, Pennsylvania in Amish country. My mom's oh, wow. side goes way back to, you know, she's a dog of the revolution. My dad's side's like very Italian where in Italy, regardless of your background, everyone has a garden. Like it's kind yeah. of a place to grow food in, in Western Europe like that. And that's how um, it should be. That's how it should that's be. How it's, yeah. We're so grocery store dependent. And so oh, right yeah. now I have two nice two by two and a half by 12 foot beds where I grow a lot of peppers because peppers are expensive. So it's easy to grow peppers. I have okra, yeah. cherry tomatoes. I have kale that, and then I'm going to put some low tunnels and I'm going to do greens all winter here. Nice. Well, and, and a lot of people like, cause I mean, y'all, y'all's climb your 8A, your 8A mm-hmm. you said. Yep. Yeah. So a, a lot of people down here, you know, it's we're in 9A, so it's a little bit different. Uh, but you know, we grow, I, I only grow like leafy greens during the winter. Like it, yes. it, it's not even, it's not even worth it to do it in, in the spring. Like, you know, I did Brussels sprouts one year. I did Brussels sprouts <laughs> one year and I, I think I planned them like in October yeah. And God, dude, I had like, I was picking, you know, Brussels sprouts, you know, you think like it's going to grow fast, but it is a slow growing plant. You're picking a sprout at a time. <laughs> like it's, 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 it's tough, man. Uh, it's tough. I gotta, to... I gotta... Go for it. Sorry. No, no, go ahead. My thing is I grew up gardening in Pennsylvania. So the growing zone is we we're like six B. And so we had that like, Oh, summertime is when you do everything. And then I come down here to eight A and the only reason it's not warmer is because of those frequent freezes, uh, those intermittent freezes in the winter. But we'll have mm-hmm. random like 80 degree days. Farmer's Almanac last freeze is April 1st. But all of April, you'll hit all these 80 degree days and all my greens will just bolt. And you're like, yeah. Ah. Uh, but up, up in north, we don't necessarily have that problem. None of these bolting problems all summer long. Yeah, man. It's it's and and every year is different. You know, people ask me like, "How do you do this? How do you do this?" Like, well, I'll tell you at the end of the year. You know, because <laughs> you know this year is going to be different than last year, and and you know it's never the same. It's never you the same. You have to love gardening. You, know. you have to love the experimentation oh, yeah. of it. You have to almost be like a uh, a masochist. Is it a sado or sadist or a masochist that like masochist inflicts pain that, on yeah, themselves? Appreciate the pain, it, the growing pains. Right. It's a, it's a, it's a little bit of torture, you know, a little bit of torture to get, a, you know, it's probably a lot more torture than it, than reward, you know, like mm-hmm. physical reward, but like in, inside it's, it's, it's very therapeutic. And, you know, I, 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 I do a high voltage electrical testing for a living up. I work in substations and climbing like not towers, but like, you know, I climb mm-hmm. stuff and I'm near like stuff that'll kill you every day. Wow. And so I work four tens, you know, I, I work from 6am to 4.30 Monday through Thursday. And when I leave the gate at 4.30 on Thursday afternoon, I don't think about work until 6am Monday morning and everything is just focused on gardening. And like, it's like a healing process. It's like, I go to a spa oh my gosh, every 100%. single percent. Yeah. No, it's yeah. It's, they, it's, they say there is research that if you get dirt under your nails, it releases endorphins in your body for going out. Really? Yeah. There there's, so don't, I don't have the research paper, but he's a like, scientist. Listen to him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I am a scientist. Um, but dude, you go out there and like, you can get lost for an hour. And I oh, don't, yeah. if you wake me up at five 30 and like, I have to be at the office at eight and granted, like I have to help get the lunches and get the kids off to school and whatnot but going out there and just like greeting the morning in your garden there's nothing better 
That's why I love doing coffee in the garden on Fridays. And mm-hmm. I'm not having been the best about it lately, uh, but I like doing coffee. I might do it tomorrow morning. You know, who knows? Uh, who knows just go out there and I'll drink coffee in the garden and just talk to people. You know, I, uh, I, I do, you, do you do lives very often? You should do some lives out in the I, garden. I, I answer like some big questions. I think I was a little n- nervous, like, and maybe it doesn't matter, right? Uh, take my ego out of the situation if I only have two people live with me, but because I, I would appreciate that one-on-one combo. Out in the, in the, oh yeah the, during fig season man if you guys i'm gonna start doing it then uh yeah you should come out and have figs and coffee with me because my youtube videos i started doing figs and coffee and it's starting to like I hear people like why are you doing figs and coffee and i was like ah i got yeah now i am doing figs and coffee now <laughs> do you do a lot of cooking with them i don't because i eat them fresh a lot but um baking them in the breads is really awesome people like they they do cook well because even if you get an underripe fig you're gonna have those starches that can be, um, what's it? The amylase, so amylization. So you can convert starches to sugars through a cooking right. process, which is actually how beer is brewed. Well, and and by unripe, you don't mean like full latex. You mean no. like oh it's sli- no. it's not it's not slightly you know ripe. It's not <laughs> you know it's slightly underripe. You know, and and that's another thing I didn't know. People with latex allergies can have issues with figs. You know, yes. not like not go into like anaphylactic shock, but they may have like redness and itchiness and stuff like that, depending on when they eat it. Right. You know, if it's full of latex, uh, you know, full of latex, anyone's going to react to that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I'll get, I'll get a little itchy sometimes when I go out there and mess with them and get that stuff on me, but Mm -hmm. figs aren't the only plant to produce latex like that either. So Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's that my plumerias do that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, my, my wife recently made like some homemade, uh, fig Newtons and, and they were so good, dude. So good. Well, did you, she, do, uh, did you do one variety of fig or did you do a little cacophony of a few varieties? No, nah, just a little bit of everything, a little nice bit of man. everything. Most, most, mostly like your berry figs, you know, stuff right. like, uh, uh, you know, I would, I would, I would classify like, you know, Violet de Bordeaux, uh, that little miss figgy, um, mm-hmm. we have one called Italian black. Mm-hmm. Um, it's kind of, it's kind of like a, a black mission. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, um, a purple passion. Um, uh, you Ooh. know, I, I got a bunch of these cuttings from somebody and they called them what they called them. Uh, you know, it, once you lose the label on your fig tree, it's anybody's guess what that fig is. I, do you get, I have lot, an amazing do you get a lot of those? Yeah, dude, I have an amazing one in the ground. Yeah. I know it's a Mount Etna type, so I just call it Mount Etna, but it says Brooklyn Park JD. Whatever that is, oh, yeah. it's a great Oh, is it, from, is it from Fig Hunter? No, it's from... Okay. There's another great guy up in Pennsylvania. It's Bill. It's off the beaten path nurseries, and he kind of took me under his wing, uh, and he's he's brilliant. He's obsessed with figs. He's a chemistry teacher, too, I think. Um, oh, wow. But he's up in the Lancaster area. Um, but no, I have, I got about 10 cuttings from the fig hunter and nine of them rooted. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, because rooting's Absolutely. a numbers game, right? Um, right. If you're going to do one propagation, you might as well do 20. You exactly. know, there's, there's no point of being a hero and just doing one cutting that's six foot long, you know, make a bunch of them. That's like, you know, I, I usually do them probably six to eight, you know, not much bigger than that no. uh, because you're going to, you're going to have die back. Right. Yeah, and, uh, and, and I don't know, you know, I guess this is a good question. Uh, so are you a rapper or not? Do you wrap the tops? I wrap the tops. Um, if they don't, if it's not a terminal node. Correct. Um, yeah. because there's a lot, you want to retain moisture, right? They're going to use that to conserve any sort of energy. So my big emphasis and like whether, whether you dip it in wax or you use the parafilm, which I do, um, I will wrap the top on cuttings. Oh, wow. So you actually dip them in some wax. I know people that do. I don't. It's way easier oh. for me. I don't have the setup. It's way easier for me just to no. grab the, yeah. The, the, <laughs> the, the grafting tape or whatever. I yes. that's, this, this was my first year doing grafting tape. I probably did, I probably did over 200 cuttings and I had probably 80%, 80 to 90%. Heck yeah, man. And, um, I tried some different rooting hormones this year. I went with, uh, there's one that like uh, all the pot growers use. I forget what it's called. Clonex. Clonex. Yeah. 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 Um, 
the ones I used that gel with did not make it. Mm. It was too moist. They, you, yeah, they, I was going to say, how did you apply it? I dipped it. Dip I it? dipped them. I, I get a, and, and you're probably, you probably are on the opposite side of this. I'm a dipper, like mm-hmm. in the powder and stuff. I know there's some contamination that can happen with that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I, how do you, how do you feel? I get a lot of questions about that. Like people I say, put in a, put in a dish and apply it. That is straight liquid instead of a gel. Yes. And so I think having a liquid allows better absorption through that cambium layer. Uh, the powder I think can be a little finicky. And I think I've heard the gel just dipping it can be a little too much saturation. I think so. so. What I also saw, there's another guy that I saw once on a YouTube video that I thought was brilliant that I'm going to do this winter is he used a, a small paintbrush with the Clonex and he brushed on the Clonex in that way. Yeah. Like, say you score your cut-ins, you can brush it into the, into the cut marks versus okay. um, just dipping the whole thing. Cause then it's such a Goldilocks zone of trying not to, you want it wet, you want to encourage root growth, but you too much. And all of a sudden you're dead yep. and you're like, you know, what did I do? So, so, uh-huh. so do you strip your do you strip your uh, the nodes back? Do you do any stripping, or do you just straight up? I do the bark one on? strip, and it's strictly out of experimentation. So, if I wish I had a cutting with me, but if I take one, I'll expose it. Say this is the cutting right here. I'll just do one little cut, and then the one little I strip. score around it. And I've seen okay. roots come out of because wherever the edges of that that cut are that's where the roots are going to come from. Okay. Um, I think I did a post cause you, you need that green layer to kind of carry right. nutrients, right? If you strip Correct. it completely, you're going to start seeing the roots form right on the base where it's been cut initially. But I, I've, I've seen it. I, I've seen it both ways. Cause cool. I, I'm a full, I, I strip, I'm a, a complete stripper. I strip nice. a nude <laughs> uh, about an inch or two, but then I've got friends who don't strip at all. I, I, say, that don't, I know people that don't do anything. And if you look you right know, around, the, you can see the actual little white dots that'll send out yep. those, those search um, routes right around yep. the node. Well, and, you know, in Italy, like you were talking about, like, you know, the, the, the term, uh, I don't give a fig. Is was an actual was an actual term back in the day, and people used it because figs were so common that you know if they had to cut one down, it's like oh it's okay, there's another one. I don't give a fig. Like it's yeah. not worth anything. Mm-hmm. You know, like you know the the grandmas in Italy would just take a cutting and just go stick it in the ground. Because you know, they, they would take a lemon just and and it would come up. I didn't say you know, for it's anyone just, has a fig tree, like try that. I did that. Yeah, I took. I usually took a sucker that had like a root. Stuck it in a pot. It was like February, and I threw it over here, and all of a sudden the fig sprouted, and I was like, "This is this is the best." Like, there's something oh, yeah. beautifully resilient about a fig that we touched on earlier. But absolutely, I, I, you know, I think the one of the more fun things is propagating some of these more fickle, finicky varieties because yeah. the the reward the risk reward is high. Um, yeah, but I think that like the hardest part of a fig is getting it established. Once it is, is established, good luck getting rid of it in a way. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, and, uh, you were talking about, you know, taking the stuff, the, the lamb and just sticking in the ground. What I've also seen, and maybe you can try this since most of yours are in the ground. Mm-hmm. If you have a low lay, low lying limb and it's kind of hanging out already, I've, I've seen it where the, the ones that hung really low that were actually so heavy, they touched the ground and they started growing roots yeah. right off the side of the limb. So if you have like some of those, you could like probably do an experiment and take a brick and just stick it, like hold it down to the ground, like around some mulch. Mm-hmm. And I bet it would, t- it would grow roots. Oh, I, believe I bet it. it would. T- In fact, I had where I spoke at the Wilmington Hobby Greenhouse Club where I go, uh, a guy came, pulled me aside and he's like, I did this and it sprouted. And like you hear stories about the creeping fig, right? Uh, mm-hmm. And, and I've heard stories of actually people, the trees fall over hurricane season. Yeah. And all of a sudden it's over here now. And right. <laughs> you can't, like you you, you can't get rid of it and it's kind of a, a like if anyone's tried to air layer anything right it's a similar concept where yeah all of a sudden instead of putting the soil up there you shove it down towards the soil have you had any success with uh air layering have you done quite a, any of those last year uh, i probably had a low success rate because i made too wet of a mix that was too dense so i didn't get enough okay. airflow through there to encourage the root product root growth 
yeah. but I had at least of the 15, four of them. And it was, I used one of those plastic balls I got on Amazon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I did that. Um, and I used just straight cocoa core. Mm -hmm. Cocoa core is the best straight... for me, by the way, if yeah. anyone's curious. Cocoa... Yeah. Yeah. Cocoa core or uh spang of moss. Spang mm -hmm. Spang of moss is a really good one as well. I actually learned, I learned that from a, a bonsai guy. I've been getting into bonsai lately. Oh, cool. Um, and, and so uh, they do a lot of air layerings for like maples and stuff like that to get quick, you know, trees. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but yeah, man, uh, I, I definitely, uh, have you had the people who, cause I don't know if, have you, have you done a bunch of videos? Like I, I, I probably once every six months, I'll do like a propagation oh. video mm -hmm. and using the like uh, rooting hormone. I get mm -hmm. a lot of people saying, oh, you can use honey or you can use uh, aloe or whatever, you know. And uh, I always tell people about the honey. I'm like, why would I waste good honey when I've got <laughs> when I've got rooting hormone right here? It's honey so expensive. I mean, honey's so per, expensive. Uh, why would way, I waste good honey on save a, the bees? Right. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I just got to say. Yeah. That. But uh, but I think. I haven't tried any of those. I think this winter is going to be another big push. Uh, this year was a lot of like testing varieties for this climate that I get. I'm, I'm on the East coast. It's very humid. Yeah. You're in Houston. You, you deal with humidity too. I'm sure. Oh yeah. It's bad. Uh, and <laughs> yeah. And I really want to focus on the ones that'll thrive here. And then the next stage is ones that'll thrive in, kind of a cooler climate because I have a background yeah. in that. And then if you're in California, anything will grow there. So you just do your thing. Um, right. So, so you're kind of building, you're kind of building your inventory. For sure. Yeah. So, so you're, you're building your inventory. You're building like your stock of like your mother plants. Right. Like that's what I call, that's what I call my main trees. I call them my mother plants. Mothers, you know, they yep. give birth, they give birth to the next generation of fig trees. Exactly. And that's awesome. Yeah. I, I, I didn't bring any of them in the greenhouse mm -hmm. because I wanted to see what would, what would come back. And, mm -hmm. you know, especially cause they're all in containers. There are varieties that will come back if they're in the ground, but the, when it's in a container, you got like that cool, like vortex, that like surround, like the wind, the cool air, Yep. you know? So, so I, I only kept the varieties like my, uh, I had a, I had the tiger and I mm -hmm. had the, the, de the desert king and they did not make it. They did not. But everything else I had. So well, I, I only want to. Pro you, so don't worry. <laughs> awesome. Is that how you pronounce it? I was saying panache. Panache. Tiger. I think wherever you are. I'm not too picky. Yeah. So like you'll but see it's it. A, you know, people it, actually it, put an accent on the end. Other people won't. And then you're like, oh, panache. Oh, panache. Well, so if, if, if it's a uh, an Italian fig, then I guess it would panache or panache. Panache. You know, like, panache. You know. Yeah. Pronounce <laughs> it all right. But if it's French. Hey, yeah, panache. But, panache. I don't. I, don't I, I do the worst. Do I do the worst accents, man? Uh, but yeah, so so I only want to propagate and sell people figs that I know for a fact are going to do really good in this area. Yes, because yes. you know I, I don't want you to come back and buy another fig from me because. You, yours died. I want you right. to come back and buy another fig from me because this one did so good. I want another one. You know, that's, mm -hmm. that's what I want. You it's know, kind of like account management. Like you're like, I yeah. you feel you love these figs so much. You want people to have that same experience. And so you go out there and you're like, I have people that are like, look at my fig tree. And I'm like, yes. Like you're just as stoked for them when they eat a fig off yes. of it. You're like, ah, oh, they got oh, it. They man. got the fig. <laughs> they whenever, whenever I get, sorry, I, whenever I get, um, DMs, uh, people that like bought a fig tree for me, like, hey, we just picked our first fig. I'm like, oh, that's so awesome. Yeah, that's so awesome. Whoever man. sees I freaking... this, like, we are actually stoked for you with our fig tree. Oh, trees. yeah. <laughs> oh, oh my God, dude. It's, you know, it's, uh, it's not about the money because you're never going to become a millionaire selling fig trees. No, I mean, no. it's, it, it's a, it's a niche market for people who actually, you know, they got to know what figs are, you know, hopefully we can expose them to what figs are and broaden that market. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, not everybody likes eating everything. So, I mean, right. not everybody's going to want, uh, but what I actually tell people is even if you don't like to eat figs, grow a fig tree and feed the birds, you know, like feed the ecosystem, <laughs> feed, and they're you know, beautiful, like part of a fig, tree. like yes. they're ornate, their ornate leaf structure, like they are a showstopper in anyone's property. Like I say that on my oh, website, like it's a centerpiece in your yard. 
Yeah. Well, especially during the summer when you like need some shade, like for your, your lawn, it's like that. It'll, it'll, I mean, figs will get huge. They'll get, they'll get as big as you let them get. People always ask me, how, how big is this fig going to get? And I was like, it'll get as big as you let it get. You as know? big as you want it's, it to. It, yeah. It's like a fish no, in a lake. Like it's, it's dependent on the environment that it's in. Exactly. man. It, exactly. Uh, yeah. It's, you know, it's, figs are crazy. You know, I, I I've been a big fan and I, I'm kind of, uh, you know, I started out with figs and I kind of expanded my uh, flavor a little bit, you know, moving to other plants. But like figs are like the foundation. If I ever need to, like I I, I did a, uh, I guest hosted a radio show here in Houston like one time. And I was like, hey, it was, it was like at uh, six to 10. So I was like, hey, on a Sunday, y'all all call in and ask me fig questions. So I sound smart. You know, I was like, because if, because if all else fails, I can write a book about figs or talk about figs for like an hour, you know, just mm -hmm. keep on going on. Keep on so going. I, yeah. It's the foundation. It's the foundation. It really is. I mean, I think, and, and I think that's what got me obsessed with it is there's so many base principles of growing plants that are in figs and then their resiliency on top of that. And, you know, like from one fig, I guess you can have this with tomatoes or peppers, but like, it, the flavors and the variety of figs proliferates quickly, you know, of what yep. you can try and taste and see the difference in. Have, do, you, do you find that the older the tree, the better the flavor is or like the 100%. higher quality? Yeah. Yep. Even if, even yep. if they die back, even if they die back, I feel like the quality and the size gets bigger every year. I feel like it, it does. It does. Absolutely. Like anyone who has a, if you have a three-year-old plus tree, that gets anywhere past five feet and you start get seeing that true fruit set, like it gets better and better and better. And then like I, I had a, a Galicia Negra fig from Spain that has this beautiful, dark, like grape wine, red pulp and a 15 year old tree is like, you can immediately be like, this is a great fig because it yeah. ends versus like my two year old tree that like, yeah, it's great. All figs are good. Some figs are great. And having them, big established tree really sets is a difference yeah well uh what is your go-to fig like if you if like if someone comes up to you at, like your market or like, or when you're at the nursery dropping some figs off um are, are, are like what is the one you recommend the most if i have it on me i recommend figo preto or black madera so like one of those black two okay um, is it, they're essentially explain. the same. Uh, Figo Preto is just the gener generic Portuguese name. Uh, Black Madeira got really hyped up because of um, the UC Davis repository had it. Uh, the old fig forum, Figs for Fun, which you can still access. It's no longer an active forum, but that place is a wealth of knowledge. Um, okay. They always idolized black Madeira figs, and it's essentially a dark fig. It probably ripens. It's a little later of a ripener, um, but if you want to have that that moment of like, holy cow, this is really good, that fig will provide that for you, and it's quite yeah. precocious. So, like, you will get figs in the first two years of having it. It's a little tricky oh, wow. to root, and all of them that I've you know rooted have sold immediately, but it's it's a reliant fig. Uh, I would say it's not the cold hardiest. If it's, if you're in a colder climate, get a type of Mount Etna fig. Um, and I have a few. So like a Marseille black is a great Mount Etna fig that tastes wonderful and has all those berry tones too. Okay. I, I've got the white Marseille. Um, mm -hmm. I wonder if, I wonder if a hardy Chicago would be in that Mount Etna. It uh, would. Variety. Absolutely. The, the, the hardy Chicago has been a game changer for me. Uh, they ba they barely lost their leaves. They uh -huh. didn't die back like at all. Um, man, the the hardy Chicago's are just insane, and they're super they, easy. They live to up to the name because yeah, they even if they do die back, they come back quickly and they fruit quickly. Another one that's like that is Rhone de Bordeaux. So it's I've different heard of that from one. violet. It's round. Uh, I also have sold out of that one too, but it's early ripening. And so if you live in a cooler climate where it takes time to wake up or uh, you get cool quickly, it'll push out fruit for you. And it's a great variety. Nice. And, and, and your website, you show, uh, are, you're shipping like nationwide pretty much like 
Have you have you shipped like all around the U.S.? I ship all over the U.S. I think it's California has some regulations. I'm certified here in North Carolina for all 50 states, uh, and I have to renew that every year and get checked. But um, California has its own set of regulations. I have shipped there. It has worked out for me. But, and um, okay. But I'm not guaranteed because they do want to do inspections, and I and I respect that completely. Uh, I do not do international shipping or to Canada. No, it's too much. It's too much trouble. Mm -hmm. And and and, the, and these are rooted plants. So you don't you don't do cut. You don't ship cuttings. I ship cuttings as well. Absolutely. I'm oh, going to okay. do a big sale this this winter. I'm going to wait till um, it gets nice and cool. I really want to maximize growth in a lot of my trees. A lot of the ones I experimented with that I didn't get to taste, uh, I focus on the growth. And I want that growth yeah. to lignify so it'll store well and it can be shipped. Yeah. The, um, a really good resource that I found, uh, actually, usually on my birthday every year, I go on figbid.com. Figbid's and great. I order. Figbid is great. If y'all are looking for like very specific varieties, um, I know Fig Hunter sells a lot of stuff on there. Mm -hmm. um, I, do you, I, do I you sell, sell on there too. You sell on a Figbid. Figbid.com. Figbid. Go create an account. It's like eBay for figs, and they they do other exotic uh, stuff as well. Yes, um, <clears throat> on there, there's a category for like it's it's mostly figs, but then it's like other, you know, it's just you and can it's get all like, kinds of fruits, and then there's like supplies. So I like I buy my tape on there too, my grafting tape. So, oh, nice, yeah. nice. And, and, and the guy really cared about doing this because eBay was shoddy, and all of a sudden people weren't getting the varieties that they had paid yeah. for, and that can be really rough. Yeah. It's definitely like that with, I found, I found that like, I don't buy seeds on Amazon anymore. I, I, I mm -hmm. would buy seeds on Amazon and eBay. You know, I, I try to find like a real dependable, preferably like buying local if I can, when I'm buying anything. But when you're looking for like specific, you know, varieties of figs, you got to get like on Figbid or go on your website, uh, right. Phil's Figs. Hey, did you... And now, and I'm sure you've thought of this and I want to ask you, did you think about doing Phil's figs with a pH on the figs? Did you think about doing that? <laughs> yes, I did. It started that way. And <laughs> the only reason I changed is just strictly for like user friendliness. Like people are like, you know, like, uh, and I could go down, I went down so many rabbit holes where I'm sitting there giggling on the couch with my wife. Like what else? Like think of all the <laughs> F words we could switch to pH and all the pH words. Like... <laughs> Phil's figs forever, you know, like with a pH, like, oh, you know, dude, we, we were talking about like even doing a big fig fest this year. My dad loves, or my dad, and my brother love making pizzas. And so we were like, we're going to do Phil's fantastic freaking fig fest. And it's all going to be pHs. We're just post it, you know? <laughs> well, d dude, next year we need to try to go to the fig hunters thing. The fig dude, hunter was amazing. doing some kind of, he, he was like, dude, I want you to come and be a host. He like, he like messaged me like a week and a half ago. Hey, we're doing the fig fest. We want you to come and be a judge. And like, it's like a week and a half, dude. Like, is it that a little bit more? Holy cow! Well, no, it like it was. He he only told me like a week and a half in advance. Oh, is what gotcha. I meant like to to be there. I was like, dude, I'd love to. I don't ever travel outside of, outside of Texas, especially mm -hmm. California. Uh, <laughs> but if I was gonna go, if I was gonna go somewhere, it'd be for a fig festival, you know. Yeah. Uh, so we should tr we should try to both go to his next event. Dude, let's and do, do it. something like that. I mean, yeah, we'll have to we'll have to plan it out. Yeah, because um, I think it's about an hour or so from Sacramento. So if you yeah, can get a no, flight he, to Sacramento, he's, he's, yeah, no, yeah, I think we. I mean, it wouldn't be that bad of a flight, and we'll just sleep in like underneath one of his fig trees out there, you know, at his at his place. I'm not complaining. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I. So, do you have as bad a problem with birds getting your figs as I do? Yes. And I'm annoyed because like, okay, I call it the nature tax. It's okay. Yeah. I want, yep. I want you to be there, but also don't stick a hole in every fig and not eat the whole thing. Just take just one. Like one hole. And yeah. then they'll just bing, 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 bing. And then the other Dude. one, my squirrels are worse though. My squirrels are now, rough. A, that was my next question. I don't have squirrels. Thank God. I don't have oh. any squirrels. Thank God. But I can only imagine that they would be terrible. And they, they taunt you. Like the squirrel really? will sit there eating a fig, looking at me from like, I'm drinking my coffee out the window and we're just doing this. Like, are you to come out here? Are you going to come out here, Phil? And I'm like, uh, yes, I am. And I went out there, but, um, I've been doing the organza bags because, yeah, and I it's, they'll sacrifice one or two figs 
it's not like, oh, these Steelers games bag back off. Like they yeah. will attempt to mess with it. And if it gets really bad, I'll do the bird nets uh, and I'll wrap it. Um, the, the the bird I, I found the bird nets to be pretty much ineffective because I don't know what kind of birds you have like mainly going out. I got mocking birds mostly going after mm-hmm. mine, but they're so damn smart that they'll figure out a way underneath it. You know, it's it's more of a deterrent. I had to it's like, not gonna tie like, it. I had the, the squirrels yeah. figured a way underneath it, so I would go yeah. after the twine and I'd have to tie underneath, and it looked like a big lollipop, you know. And they still yeah. attempted. I watched them attempting. I had a fun chuckle about it, but like the the organza yeah. bags have been okay for me because they'll have one or two and they'll give up because they're like it's not worth it to them. I have found that the organza bags will not stop a possum. <laughs> a possum. <laughs> At least you want to uh, tips, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm in, I'm I'm kind of in I'm in a subdivision. We ain't got no ticks, but you know I'm I, I, I'm I, I'm more than happy to sacrifice. You know I I call you know it, it's the tax. You know, it's the nature. The, I, the nature IRS tax, is right? always gonna the IRS is always gonna get their cut. You know, uh, so I don't mind losing some figs every once in a while. You know, as long as you know, they don't eat them all. But usually it's the mockingbird. I get an occasional possum. You know, I, I, when I did my research for my presentation, you know, it was saying, oh, you know, uh, figs are, are uh, deer, deer resistant. They're deer proof because of the latex that most people, most of them aren't going to eat the leaves. And I posted that and they're like, nope, they'll eat the, the deer will eat the leaves too. I, I've I, heard I, myths I like they will eat the leaves and they're like, they won't come back later. But I've also seen them sick here. or something. Maybe. I, it must be it. They, they, I've seen them just like, destroy gardens here in north carolina yeah but yeah now i i would think that the latex would be a deterrent especially i mean the latex is even in the leaves most people don't know that the reason you know there's nothing better than going outside and seeing a fig doing the droop mm-hmm. you know that seeing that you know that's when you know your fig is right because when it's doing that droop. Oh. and what and if you see what, that what, honey what, in the eye you are just excited right yes well and and what causes the droop you know, it gets pol- the, the the fig the fig gets pollinated and the latex gets sucked out, and mm-hmm. like the latex goes back and that's why it's drooping because it had all that latex holding it stiff and that's what's the that's what is causing the dro- the droop the lack of the latex, you know and so I, I would think that most animals wouldn't want to mess that latex you know it's m- my best advice for people is go out first thing in the morning and last thing in the evening in the evening and pick your figs, yeah you know just. Just make it a habit because if you don't, something's going to find them. Something's going to get. Someone's going to find it, especially if they're dark figs. I've found that the birds will get confused by the green ones temporarily, right? Uh, I figure it out eventually. They're smarter than you think, right? Uh, yep. Actually, I, do you want me to turn the light on behind me so I'm not so dark? Oh, you can. We're going to go for like five, like three. Like we're gonna, we'll go for like you know a couple more minutes, so you're good. All right, cool, man. Yeah, uh, the the green ones definitely. I've got an LSU gold, and it's like a yellowish green, mm-hmm. um, so it doesn't get that dark. And I found they don't really mess with them unless I leave them out there like way too long. Right? You know, they get because they right, they'll pick up on like the sugar spots, and they may even get a hint of it in their nose. But I think they can they can smell. You know, they mm-hmm. can smell that sugar, especially when it's especially when it's dry and there's not a lot of water around, you know, yeah. I, I feel like they're going for the moisture, you know, I feel like they're going for that. You know, I, I've heard stories of people having gardens where like coyotes come and eat their watermelons and their cantaloupes. They're just looking for water. They're just looking uh-huh. for some kind of moisture. And I think that's what happens. Uh, probably more than anything is I have sugar ants, like the crazy ants, mm-hmm. you know, that will go up and in, you know, and so. You our can see their little are, like march up the tree and you're like, ah, no, I know where they're going. Yeah. And so what we do now, we have a big jar of, and we, we, we fill it with figs, we dunk, we fill it with water okay. and then we close it up and just any ant that's in there is going to come up, you know, so that they're not sticking around inside the figs. Oh, I love that, that. That's, yeah, that's, that's a good little thing to, if there's any kind of bug or anything like that, they're going to come out. We, we've never, I've picked probably hundreds of figs and I've never seen a wasp or like a bug. I've seen ants, but mm-hmm. I mean, that's because I didn't. You know, that's about it. You know, that's, that's we really have, all we you have can like do. a huge Celeste tree on the side of the house here, and it's got to be 15 feet tall and 20 feet wide. And the whole ecosystem gets it. Everyone gets a fig. We get plenty of figs from it, but I yeah. have seen all the bugs on that one. Uh, but we also are a wet spot here. We'll get that 4 p.m. thunderstorm every day in the summer. Um, yeah. But, but um, 
that's nice yeah, you don't I, get I'm, the bad bugs like like uh, we'll, we'll get that on occasion here yeah i mean for the most part they're pretty pest resistant you know mm -hmm. like they're they're you don't really need this i do a i do a weekly um i'll do neem oil and i'll throw in like a organic foliar feeding of like liquid fertilizer like mm -hmm. once a week and i give my figs fully feeding once a week and so uh and that kind of knocks out like any of the like i don't have aphid pressure or you know, you'll get Same. the you'll get the rust. You you'll get the rust, but I mean, people freak out when they see rust on their leaves. Yeah, people they send me freak pictures, out, and like I'm happy to help. You know, coach you through. It's okay because yeah. a lot of times your fig tree is going to lose those leaves anyway as that growth happens and it lignifies. It's just growing. Yeah, if if it's not reaching the sun, so if you see that rust on there, you can use the um the copper fungicide if you really if you really see an issue but it's not worth I it just let I, them would, dry. I just let them yeah dry. yeah i'm on board let, with that uh, for sure uh, <laughs> as, as joel salton says he, he like lets the pig the pigginess of the pig come out i let the figginess of the fig i let it do its thing yeah you know, i'm not gonna i'm not gonna mess with that you know i just if it drops leaves it drops leaves man right. it's it's not worth it to me um uh, my, my favorite one is when i uh get someone saying that I think my fig's got fig mosaic virus. I'm like, every fig has fig <laughs> mosaic. What? what? It's a very popular disease. It's kind of like the herpes of figs. So like 80 plus percent of fig trees have fig mosaic virus in them somewhere. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. see, I, see, I thought it was fairly common in... Some of the research I had done, the mosaic virus that once you had it, you had to like get rid of that fig because it could spread. But I, I didn't know that most of them had like actually had it like dormant in them or anything like that. Yeah, I think it just happens from like, and maybe it's maybe that's a common thing amongst the fig collectors. So when you start getting to the more rare varieties, because if you are essentially if you're not wiping down your your clippers every time you're essentially exposing every tree to that fig mosaic virus. If you do get any sort That's of true. aphid or spider mite, they can carry the virus from tree to tree. Uh, and right. It kind of just stays with them. And it, But it really affects them when they're breaking dormancy or when they're small. Or when they're breaking okay. dormancy when they're small. Yeah, it must not be much of a, much of a problem down here. I, I, I have never seen it. I've never seen it in any fig at all down here some things get more affected than others i have some rare ones like um bucci automate and it's new to me i wanted to try it out it bloomed say it again and it can bear say it again it, uh, <laughs> bucci amare <laughs> <laughs> it's very italian i we could call it like bucci amare right <laughs> i know bucci I, I amare I know <laughs> bucci yeah. amare yeah but uh yeah it, it had i wonder if it's more common thing. like smear nose and stuff I wonder if it's more common, like on the Smyrna's and the Capra figs. Maybe it could be, um, if those say all those like fig wasps are carrying the disease. But I really think that uh, that I've seen it more than I haven't, and maybe really? it's because I've been propagating so much over time. Uh, okay. But what I see them do is grow out of it quite quickly. Oh wow! Okay, I need to do some more research on it then because I. You know, I see the rust, you know, this time of year, I'm getting a bunch of rust and losing leaves. You mm -hmm. know, we, the breba, the breba, the breba crop is almost over and then we're going to have that badass fall crop. You know, I, oh I'm picking gosh. figs, dude, I'm picking figs like into December. Like yeah. I'm like, it, it's, it's wild, you know, and honestly we've had frosts and light freezes and the figs won't drop. Mm -hmm. Then they will they will hold on, uh, but you will they will taste a little freezer burnt. What I've noticed. I will ask you this: Have you noticed that my Figo Preto does this? My Violet de Soleil did, did this as well. They'll lose their leaves kind of in the fall, but the fruit will stay on there and it'll still ripen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I have that. I have that on certain certain varieties. Usually, it's after that. You know, the the spring crop is called the Breba crop. And what mm -hmm. is the fall crop called? Is it just the norm? The, the, the fall crop is like the quality, quality crop. Yeah, I just, we, you know. I call it the main crop. Um, yeah. But there's a fancy not, Italian you, word. If they have two crops, they're bifere. And if it's one crop, it's unifere. That's, that's the one I've heard before. Yeah. And, and, and most of your common figs are going to give you two crops. You're going to get that Breba and you're going to get that super yeah. high quality crop in the, in the fall uh, or winter as, you know, pretty much here. Um, but usually, 
the last fig will drop and then it it won't completely defoliate but a lot of it will fall off you know yeah. and, and then we start getting a uh, little figlets my, my my favorite term for you know the the proper term for a little baby fig is called a figlet you know the i love figlet. it you know oh. i love the little figlets you know <laughs> it's it's wild man well hey we're over an hour um sweet uh, tell tell everybody where they can find you where they can check out your website uh tell them what you got going on if you got any events coming up let them know yeah absolutely hey guys i a lot of my content is on instagram at phil's figs with an f for figs uh as much as i wanted the ph uh, on YouTube, it's the same, Phil's Figs, and then philsfigs.com. So I kept it simple. Reach out to me with questions. I'm happy to answer them. I could talk for hours on figs, and I'm happy to do it. Um, and then I think my next presentation, a lot of my stuff's here in Wilmington, North Carolina. But um, if you're in the North Carolina area and you're looking for someone to present on figs, I'm happy to do it as well. Absolutely. I've actually got a sister-in-law in, well, sister -in, -law in South Carolina. But I was... My my sister just moved, her husband was a drill instructor in the, in the army and he oh, just cool. got it he just got out he was in North Carolina and then yeah. my sister in law and brother in law both moved to South Carolina he's in the Air Whereabouts, Force uh, so Wilmington's about an hour from Myrtle Beach okay they're they're in Charleston they're in Charleston so it's about three three and a half hours yeah Great town, yeah, by the way. Right. yeah I, I've never been my wife got to go for like a week and a half and mm -hmm. I didn't so I I would like to go there and maybe even. Do some. I would. I need to do some traveling. Maybe in the fall, uh, I want to do some traveling, go around and see some people. Like maybe we can, you know, if we make it up there that way, maybe we can come by and check your Dude, place out. Come on up to Wilmington. We'll do some. I I see some varieties all over here. I'm trying to document. We'll eat figs. We'll hang out. We'll go to the beach. You name it, man. Awesome, awesome, man. Well, I appreciate you coming on. 